Um, I even I I even think too, and we'll we'll talk more about this this morning. But like twenty, what is what does this look like? What does partiality and favoritism look like in twenty twenty three? One, it can be along different lines other than socioeconomic on how we include people. We include people at different levels. We're like we're conscious enough now. It's twenty twenty three. We are actually better as people. <laughs> we can actually believe that. That's a joke. But like the so. We can actually start to inc- like be totally inclusive of socioeconomic, but there are other other areas where we're not in, we're not willing to include people at all levels of the table. I actually think the other thing that's interesting for us to consider is partiality, not just at the level of who's included in the community, but above that, who gets invested in. So it's like everybody's here. We're not getting it. Like he's saying, this is a meeting. This is an assembly. It's like everybody's in the assembly. We're not like separating out in the assembly. But if you think about who gets discipled, who gets invested in, who gets mentored, is there partiality there? And of the people who are getting discipled and mentored, who gets to serve? Who gets invited to help and to contribute? Is there partiality there? And the top one is like who actually is, is seen as potential to lead and empowered? Now, I think there's, um, th- this, this is really the thought behind that whole theory of when helping hurts. You know, if you've ever read that book about Western kind of enga- engagement and global missions, a lot, a lot of the framework behind um, unearthing how Western missions or involvement in the, in, around the globe has actually, in some situations, hurt people can be around some of this partiality. It's like we're including everyone. We want everybody to be included. We're not actually uh, creating an honor or dishonor system based on you know, people's objective looks or, or anything like that. But then there is sort of partiality applied on who can contribute, who can lead, who can be empowered. And it can create like long form dependence. It can create uh, distrust, disempowerment. And I think that's a, a part of what I want to consider this morning. Um, let me let me jump in, and I and I'm actually going to have us um, listen to something on my phone uh, in a second. But what I want to talk about this morning is how every part of kingdom life is available to every person. Every part of kingdom life is available to every person. All of the kingdom available to all people. The consequences of partiality are quite high. Uh, because it's not just, I mean, he like we see in these last couple verses, we see that the consequences of partiality personally are very high. There's some strong warnings in there. But beyond those individual warnings, which should be uh, stakes enough, they should be consequences enough, there is this possibility that the people that we're partial against and not including actually have a, an apostolic mandate on them that they're actually going to be used by God for generations of impact. And they're cut off from that mandate because of our partiality. Th- those stakes are extremely high. Extremely high. Now, God isn't going to wait around for us to like repent and grow from our partiality. He'll just find somebody else to empower that person. We just won't be a part of it. <clears throat> He's, God isn't like chained by our lack of growth or something. But that, it, it, it just makes, to me, it makes me feel like the stakes are so much more high. Last weekend, I told you I was in Arkansas. Uh, we have a, just a reminder to you, the underground in Tampa actually has sister movements around the world. We have communities like this in cities in, in the country and cities all over the world that see themselves as basically in fellowship, in sisterhood and fellowship with this community. You're bound in family with people that you don't even know all over the world, who are inspired by the life and the ethic and the story of this community and are actually birthing stories like that all, all over the world that we're now learning from, some of what they're doing. And it's become sort of this interdependent family of mutual kinship. We have a sister movement in northwest Arkansas, uh, that is, this little, where Fayetteville and Bentonville, and there, you know, there's like four or five, it's, like a, it's sort of a quad cities right there in northwest Arkansas. And uh, that community is called Samaritan. And they wanted one of us to be able to go up there and help them run their first calling lab. And they, and they want to now start doing a calling lab at least once a year, similar to what we just did. So it was interesting. We were doing a calling lab all day Saturday in northwest Arkansas at the same time that 20, 22 people were in here doing calling lab. 
Um, it was just an hour separate because of the time zone. I kept, <laughs> I kept telling the people in Arkansas what you, what the people in Tampa were talking about at this exact moment, you know, discerning together. And um, so we, we uh, sort of, I got to interact with some of their leaders. I hadn't been up there before, so I got to see their context. Really impressed, um, as always. I really love some of the leaders there. Jared Sears, if you guys know him. Matt Newman is a great, great, uh, it was my first time meeting him. Really amazing uh, leader. And they have this one guy on their team that's a little younger, and I had never met before. His name's Gilbert Gonzalez. And Gilbert was, I mean, the, the trip was great. It's hard to have a highlight. I, I, if I had to have a highlight, meeting Gilbert and spending time with Gilbert was the highlight. He has been maybe six or seven years into following Jesus. Um, he came out of a history of um, gang life and uh, has, a, has a sort of a difficult story um, of things that he's uh, been a part of in the past. And, and uh, you know, basically self-proclaims like, I'm from the streets. <laughs> and, um, and when you get to know him, and now he's, he, his position in that movement is basically their sort of catalytic servant leader, catalytic leader for the microchurches. He's sort of like overseeing and catalyzing microchurches all through that movement. And, uh, and when you listen to him, um, it just reminded me of this text because what partiality does is it either, it does one of two things. It either excludes people from being able to, to um, lead and grow, not, not just be a part of and grow, but even to serve and to lead. It excludes people. So Gilbert is the result of a community that is partiality free. You know, they, 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 uh, there was nobody sort of like excluding him at any level of his development, a a actually to the opposite, really wanting to invest in, in him and discover what Jesus was doing in his life. But the other thing that happens with partiality is if it doesn't exclude, it forces people to become like the honored ones, whoever the honored ones are. It forces the people who are on the outskirts to change some of the fundamentals of who they are, to become more like whoever in that community is honored, to lose pieces of themselves that God actually does not intend for them to lose. And um, so I, what I want to do is uh, play you the voice text that Gilbert sent to me when I left, because I just want you to hear from him. And uh, I, I thought it, I have never once in my life saved a voice text. I don't even know how long that technology has existed. But this was the one voice text I've ever saved, and, and I just thought it was amazing. And I want there's a couple times where he says nice things about me. Just disregard those. That feels a little awkward to just share publicly. Um, <laughs> but I want you to hear the rest of it because of the way he talks. Of, yeah, correct, humble brag. Because of the way he talks about you. Yeah, no, that's right. I want you to hear the way he talks about you, and I want you to hear the way that the gospel has really invaded his life with who he is has not fundamentally changed who he is. So here we go. Yo, what's up? My guy, this is Gilbert, bro. Buenos dias, man. I don't know where you're at, bro. You're probably already in Kansas City. But uh, I just wanted to tell you, bro, thank you for yesterday leading our people, man. And it was just, it was dope just hanging out, man. I wish we had more time to chop it up, man. Talk about just like, uh, hear your story and what God's doing in Tampa, bro. But praise God that, man, 100 microchurches, man. You guys are kicking up dust for the kingdom, my guy. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, man, man, what we say at Samaritan, man, like your family now, G, your family, dog. So anytime you want to come out here, you want us, dude. So anytime you want to come to back to Northwest Arkansas, bro, this is your second home, my guy. Or third home. I don't know. You're Mr. Worldwide, bro. So uh, <laughs> so whatever place it is, bro. But your family now, G. So praise God what God is doing through you. And what he's doing in, in Tampa, bro. Praise God, man. It encouraged me to see other fools doing it for the kingdom. I was like, man, no homies are getting it out there. And we're doing it too, bro. So praise God. And just thank you for yesterday, man. What a privilege and honor just be with God's people. And, and you led us, man. It was special, my dude. All right, my guy. <laughs> Y'all fools doing it for the kingdom, man. My G, kicking up dust for the kingdom. That's what you guys are doing. That's what you guys are doing. Uh, that is Gilbert. And actually, it was two days later that Jared, uh, the other one on their team, sent me a couple of saved voice messages from Gilbert. And he was like, I thought you would want to hear these. Gilbert's pretty known around here for his epic voice messages. And I was like, bro, I already got one. I already got one. I already got one. 
In order for Gilbert to be where he is right now, there needed to, he needed to be a part of a community where there was no partiality in who they do outreach to, first of all. There needed, and then when Gilbert like surrenders his life to Jesus, there needed to be no partiality in who gets included in the fullness of the community and body life. And not just there, there needed to be no partiality in whoever decides to mentor and deeply invest in, the, in his life. And not just that, there needed to be no partiality in who gets to contribute and serve this community that he's a part of. And not just that, there needed to be no partiality in who is a potential leader. Who do we evaluate as leadership potential and then empower to be leaders? If there was partiality at any of those levels, you do not have Gilbert. And I think, you, I think if you don't have Gilbert, you're actually cutting off generations of kingdom at impact in northwest Arkansas and beyond. Whoever our biases say is the least likely, there will be leaders with an apostolic mandate among those people. You can believe it. That's why these honest, sort of cutting, sharp questions are so important. Who comes into my meeting and gets special attention? Who comes into your meeting, your assembly, and gets special attention? And who, on the other hand, gets told to sit over there? I've been a part of um, communities. I was just reflecting on this now and in the past. I've been a part of communities that were largely made up of uh, married folks. And there were single people in our community who felt, you know, by just by the shape and the design and the way that our community operated, who felt like there was an, uh, there was an, an extra honor for folks who were married and had kids, and they were sort of always off to the side and not considered, um, and, and felt like there was no avenue or room to really contribute at a similar level as the, the folks who were married. Um, and I do think it, it, it you know, it is a way that we can incidentally structure ourselves as communities to be non-viable communities for single persons. And it's, it's something for us to consider that there would not be a barrier there in, in how we're organizing our meetings as a community. But it's just not, not just about meetings. It's like how we operate, how we grow, how we live, who we are investing in deeply. What are the pathways to leadership? There can be communities that are made up of people who are uh, 50, 60 plus, boomers and gen, I don't know what all the gens are. And they basically say, if anybody in this room ever says the word vibes or riz or or gas, when the kids now say gas, they mean a different thing than when I say gas. It's a different thing. And they there can be like, hey, they, when they, they just say stuff sometimes. I'm like, I don't know what they're saying anymore. And the, and it's like you guys can be over there. We're gonna leave you the door open. You can be here. It's just you there's not a really a place of honor uh for you guys. You have to I don't have a, have a you have to have like a 20 year resume and a LinkedIn or something like that to to be in to be a part of this community. And in the same way, there can be communities that are made up of young young professionals in early 20s and mid 20s and that kind of stuff. And if anybody were to show up in that assembly who's 40 or 50 plus and actually wants to talk about LinkedIn, you know, they'd be like, "No, nah, that's over there." You know, you sit over there. You there is not really a, a an angle or a place of honor for you. Similar the you know, thinking about uh, the mentally or physically um, uh, otherly abled, you know, people who are are not at the same intelligence level, people who have mental disabilities, people who have physical disabilities. If those people show up at your community, would they be included as much as possible in the life of the community? Would there be on ramps for them to serve and contribute? Would there be would they be seen as potential leaders in the future? to be considered or would they be disqualified from that arbitrary sort of category of people simply because of their mental or physical differences um, your community might if to, for our community we we don't talk about this that much anymore praise god but if your community happens to vote the same way everybody in your community votes the same way and is hyper concerned about politics and somebody shows up to your dinner and it's very clear in the first 10 minutes they vote a different way 
Are they included in the life of the body? Are they, or are they shunned to the children's table in the other room, you know? Can you do kids' church tonight? You know, can you, can you watch the kids? You might not want them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, man. Certain personality types can be cast aside. Crypto bros. You might have somebody at your, at your microchurch that if you say the word Bitcoin one more time, you are disfellowshipped, you know? Goes, there goes, he, Bill's not here. There goes Bill Coke and I are talking about blockchain again. I've never heard Bill talk about blockchain. This, who comes into your meeting and is told to sit over there? Who comes into your meeting and is given special privileges, special attention? Because whoever our biases say is the least likely and outside of our favoritism, outside of our partiality, just outside of our, par- our partiality, there will be leaders among them with an apostolic mandate who remain cut off from that destiny because of our favoritism. How do we know if favoritism is actually at work in our community? And how do we avoid that? Because these are, these are interesting questions, you know, and, and I'm going to get into just how complicated it is. Again, I think James here, what I said earlier, I think he's making a bit of a fruit to root argument. He's saying the fruit coming off the tree, the action, the observable action, is favoring the rich over the poor. That there's like a little bit of an internal class system in, their, in the life of their community. But the, that there's, a, there's an underlying assumptions behind that action that enable that action, that for, for assumptions for which that action makes sense. And those things are the, the, the branches of the tree and the trunk of the tree. And those fo- false assumptions would be things like, I, I can judge who is worthy. I am a qualified judge of who is worthy of honor or dishonor. And behind those false assumptions are false beliefs, which is the root system of the tree. And some of those false beliefs would be that I am not that bad of a lawbreaker. That's why I'm qualified to judge. That I've actually broken very little of the law compared to these other people who have broken so much of it. And therefore, I I only needed an itty-bitty pinch of mercy. I just needed a couple of salt pinches of mercy from the Lord because of my itty-bitty lawbreaking. And therefore, I am a qualified judge. I didn't need much mercy. And I think it's an interesting way that James goes goes about this that we can take note of, that James doesn't necessarily go exactly to new actions. He doesn't lay out the new way to modify their behavior right away. He doesn't tell them exactly how to change their actions and how it should look different. He doesn't go about simply the behavior modification that they need. James actually invites us, he doesn't invite us primarily to bear different fruit. He invites us to pull the roots. He doesn't go straight to the apples coming off the tree and says, hey, have some pears. He actually pulls the root out, pulls the tree out. These false beliefs. You've got to pull out that root that I am not that bad of a lawbreaker. That I only required a little bit of mercy. And therefore, it's okay for us to conduct ourselves this way. And in its place, right where he pulls out those roots, he plants a new seed that will bear a a fully different tree, a completely different tree and different fruit. And that new seed is the belief that I am a full lawbreaker and in desperate need of divine mercy. And that mercy is offered freely to me. I freely take it. And what else do I have but to freely give it? That new seed says, I am the chief of sinners. I'm the worst among us. And that seed bears, grows into a different kind of plant that speaks and acts as one who is going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Those new actions come from a new tree. Now, as a, as a room full of intentional disciple-making missionaries, we want to we be that new tree. We want to be good soil that takes in that better seed that pulls out that old root and lives a different way. But here's where it gets difficult to discern. A few, I'm just going to, a few weeks ago, um, you guys know I've, I've been living in the same neighborhood in Belmont, Belmont Heights. My wife and I lived down there for seven years. We've been very intentionally trying to do neighborhood ministry. We felt called to our neighborhood. I lead a little handyman repair service just to meet my neighbors. 
my wife intentionally sits on the front porch as much as she can and does some neighborhood like um, uh, homeschool co-op stuff. And part of that is because she wants to meet the neighbors. Uh, my neighbor on my left is hosting her baby shower in this room on October 21st or, 20, or 20th or 21st because they're, we, we love them and we're in life together and they're our neighbors and we're trying to walk with them as much as possible. But over six or seven years, it started to like, I, we've started to feel like our spiritual impact in that neighborhood in a three, four, five block radius has started to wane, has started to like stagnate. And we've started to wrestle with, well, what does that mean for us? At the same time, I helped a friend start a soccer group as a as a ministry. I had no intentions of staying with that soccer group for longer than two or three months. I just was helping some friends kick up a ministry context to be able to try to have spiritual conversations and make disciples in that place. I've stayed with that soccer group now for almost a year. And part of the reason is because there's so much spiritual openness in that place. And there's so like we're we're having so many like ministry conversations with people. There's a lot of hunger there. And three weeks ago, there was a Saturday evening where um, my neighborhood had a an opportunity to engage with our neighbors on our left in in, a, in some like relational uh, moments that I was excited about. And at the exact same time on that Saturday evening at five o'clock, the entire soccer group was getting together for a barbecue with all their kids and all their families, and they wanted me there. And I was immediately hit by this decision: I cannot do both. I have to pick. I have to pick one or the other. Who am I going to invest my time, my energy, my life into? I have to pick between these two people, these two people groups that I feel like I've been able to manage together as much as possible, but there's going to be moments like this where I have to pick. I am a limited human being. I actually cannot spend equal amounts of time with all people, all types of people, all categories of people. I have to say no to reaching certain people groups, to including certain people groups in everything I do, to investing intentionally in people as disciples who are being mentored and spiritually formed, and to empowering every kind of person. I am a limited person. I have to say no all the time to people. So objectively, if you just looked at my life, it would look a whole lot like I'm operating in favoritism and partiality. Because I'm not including every type of person in, in our microchurch. I'm not reaching every kind of person. I'm not discipling and mentoring every kind of person. I have to make choices within my limitations of who I will and who I will not do those things with. I mean, all, all of you are in similar boats. I mean, I'm looking around the room. There's people in here who are working intentionally with men that are coming out of addiction and recovery. They do not work with women coming. So how do you, how do you, how do you, Get out of an uh, out of a uh, accusation of partiality and favoritism. You're excluding half the population of the world. <laughs> How do you do that? We've got people that are working intentionally with uh, with high school students. We've got people who are intentionally working with college students. We've got people who are working intentionally in Gospel Village in Lakeland, working with people who are have a difficulty finding long term housing, and they're they've sort of created this housing community of tiny houses. They're not working with everybody. Our sense of calling, even if you don't have a sense of calling that hasn't been narrowed for you at all, you're still operating with partiality. You still can't say yes to everything and everybody that comes your way. But anybody who has some kind of narrow sense of calling, that looks a whole lot like partiality and favoritism. I can only spend a limited amount of time and energy with a limited amount of people. How, wh how do we, what do we do with that tension? How do we make intentional decisions within our limitations about who to reach and who is included and who can serve and who to empower without engaging sinful partiality, which is talked about here? That's an important question for us. And I'm going to sound like a broken record. We've been saying it every week. We, we say it again and again, and I'm going to keep saying it. We're all going to keep saying it. The answer is listening to Jesus who gets to decide who you invest in, who you include, who you walk in with, who you mentor, who you disciple, who you empower. He decides. He decides. We listen to Jesus for his direction and his calling, and Jesus decides who I am partial to. Jesus decides who you are partial to. Because if I decide, if you decide who you should and should not reach, who you should and should not include, who you should and should not invest in, who you should and should not empower, it will be entangled with your pre-existing biases 
your, your sense of hobbies, your sense of who's worth it and who's not, your imperfect assessment of who's potential and who's not, if our own voice dictates all those decisions, that will wind up in sinful partiality. I guarantee you. Jesus decides who you reach, who you include, the three to five people you can pour your life into and spiritual formation and more mentoring. That's a narrow group of people you can do that with. Jesus decides. We have to actually, it's, it's what this passage is inviting us to do. We have to disqualify ourselves as wise judges and decision makers of any of these things. He is the only qualified decision maker of how I spend my time, who I'm reaching, who I'm investing in. He is the only one qualified. He is a voice outside of myself that I submit to and surrender to entirely. I am disqualified. Now, the hard work on our part, it's not like we don't do anything. The hard work on our part, on my part, is not to decide. He decides. I listen. But I have to be legitimately open to whatever he says. That's the hard work. That's the hard work. Who is the people he would tell me to go to and I might say, nah. <laughs> or I might say, say it again. Because <laughs> who? Who's a what? So I've got to do the work. I've got to pull the roots and put in, put in new seed and figure out what my, what those sort of biases that I have are to, to th that if I were left to my own devices, I would create these social stratifications in anything that I lead and to actually do that hard work of spiritual formation to invite him to till up the soil of my life, to be open to whatever he says, to be honestly willing to dedicate our lives, our time, our energy, our resources to any type of person, any group of people that he would lead us to. Is that true of us? Is it true of me? Is it true of you? I'm going to invite up Emily as we close in worship and communion this morning. Every part of kingdom life available to every person. All of the kingdom available to all people. That everybody would have equal opportunity in the kingdom, but there will be unequal outcomes. And who decides? Jesus decides. Who is where? how they grow, how they develop, how they're empowered, Jesus decides. This week, just studying this passage and just trying to like investigate my own heart and life and thinking of stories where I've maybe done well at this and other times where I've done not so well at this, I was just reminded of a young leader who snuck through my sinful biases to have generations of impact. I was a, I crossed paths with him when I was a college student. I was up in Illinois at Southern Illinois, Illinois University Again, from the, the land of corn and beans. I come to you from the land of corn and beans. Um, I was, a, I was a, I think, a sophomore at the time. I was living in a 17-floor residential housing tower, a, um, a um, dorms, dorm tower. There were these three towers next to each other. They were called, um, very creatively, the towers. And uh, one of them was called May Smith. I lived in May Smith Tower. I lived on the eighth floor of 17 floors. And I had just recently started really following Jesus and wanting to plant little like uh, witnessing communities or Bible studies in every dorm on campus. That was our vision. That's what we were going to do. I lived in May Smith, so I was like, I got May Smith. I'm going to plant a Bible study in May Smith. And so what I, me and one other guy that lived in May Smith, we actually went from first floor to 17th floor. There's about um, 20 doors on each floor. And we took a whole day and we knocked on every single door in May Smith, inviting people to come to a Bible study at 8 p.m., in the eighth floor, in the middle. Meet in the middle. That's where my floor was. It took five hours to go from first floor to 17th floor and knock on every single door. And we would just knock on the door. They'd open up the door. We wouldn't do some kind of like conversational tricks or something like that. We'd just be like, there's going to be a Bible study on the eighth floor at eight o'clock. Do you want to come? Yes or no? If no, okay. If yes, what's your number? So we can remind you, you know, it's very simple. It's like we were just going up the, up, the, up the floor, and we were essentially just trying to see, are there, are there followers of Jesus in, in this dorm that are hungry to know other followers of Jesus? and being, which That's all we were trying to do. 8 p.m. comes. I've got my first Bible study prepped. You know, it's, I, I prepped J John 3 because John 3.16 was one of the only verses I knew at the time. So I said, let's stick to John 3. It's what I know. It's what I know. <laughs> so 
cool. I had a Bible study prepped in John 3, and we sit in this like uh, little meeting room. 8 o'clock comes around, nobody. 8.01, nobody. 8.03, nobody. I mean, we talked to hundreds, hundreds of people. 8.05, nobody. 8.07, this Latino student comes in. His name was Alfredo. For the rest of the time we knew him, we called him Al. He was from Puerto Rico. Um, we were at this point about a month into school. It was like late September. And he walks into the Bible study and he says, is this the Bible study? It's just me and my friend. And we were like, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. He said, I'm so excited. Let's do it. So we just it was just us two and Alfredo. That's all it was out of this whole dorm. And he's not a believer. He was sort of struggling with the language barrier a little bit yet. His English wasn't great yet. And um, had not yet, in a month, had not yet met or had a conversation with a single person in college over the course of a month. Living in a tower, going to classes, had not yet met and had a conversation with a single person. Very shy. And we got to the end of that Bible study, and I just felt like it was trash, and what it, this was horrible. And I just, I said, hey man, thanks for coming. And he said, when are we going to do it again? I said, we, I don't know if we'll do it again, but maybe if we do it again, we'll do it next week. And he said, that's fine, we can do this next week. But can I see you tomorrow? <laughs> I said, well, we, I mean, I guess maybe we could go to lunch tomorrow. We all go to the same like lunch cafeteria. He said, I'll see you there. Noon, we'll, we'll get lunch tomorrow. So I was like, all right, now i got lunch plans. And we walked out. We walked out of the tower, and I turned to my co-leader, and I said, that was a good try. It's a good experiment. All, it's all we had was just, we just got to try. And he said, so what, are we going to do John 4 next week? And I said, what are you talking about? We're not doing this again. He said, but you just told him that we were going to think about doing it again. I said, no, we're not. That was a waste of time. <laughs> it was a waste of time. We're not doing this again. And he was like, why aren't we doing this again? And I was like, because the people didn't come. And he said, a person came. And for me, it was like the people that I wanted to be there, the type of people that I wanted to be there, the, the, the scale of people that I thought should be there, the type of people that are worth continuing to do that with, were not in the room, and so we will not do it. And my co-leader is like, bro, we're doing this every week. We're doing this every week. And Al, Alfredo, actually became, for two years, one of our most faithful missional leaders in that fellowship of students. He started following Jesus a few weeks later, and he actually led a team of students to Puerto Rico on, a, on like a little spring break trip. And he was at every outreach event. He was at every tabling event. He talked to as many students as he could about Jesus. He led a Bible study his senior year. When I would do, out, when I would do tabling with him, we were with, at the time, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And so, sometimes people would always ask us, is InterVarsity a denomination? And we would always say, those of you who are with InterVarsity, we would say InterVarsity is interdenominational, which meant every denomination is sort of welcome here. It's not non-denominational, which is like there's no denominations. It's like inter. Oh, they're all here. And I explain that to everybody so many times. If anybody asks you this question, here's how you answer it. And I was standing next to him at a table one time, and some student asked him, what denomination is this? And he said, interdenominational. And they said, what is that? And he said, I think it's Baptist, but with a better website. <laughs> I said, Alfredo, you can't table anymore. <laughs> it's, it's so bad. A couple months ago, I had a coaching call with a guy that is the missional communities pastor at a church up in Iowa. And they wanted to talk to underground, and they're trying to think about microchurches and how to do different things. And I found out on the call, um, he went to SIU. I said, what years did you go to SIU? He said, what years? And I said, oh, that was soon after I left. Like, he, like you know, we just missed each other, whatever. And I said, and he said, I was a part of the university chapter. I was like, oh my gosh, I was too. We had all these connections in common. And I said, my gosh, now you're a missional communities pastor? Like, you've been in ministry a long time. He said, yeah, I have. Those years were super formative for me. And I said, were you in somebody's Bible study? And he said, Alfredo discipled me for 18 months. And that, and that dude, we had one Bible study in a tower, and I thought, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Praise God that his voice overruled my biases, my partiality, my favoritism, my inadequate judgment of who is worth including and who is worth investing in. Praise Jesus that he helped me early on to pull the roots of prejudice and plant a new seed that I am the chief of sinners and therefore a disqualified judge 
and the only tool I have left in my hands in place of that judgment is to dispense the same divine grace that I've drank so deeply of for so many years. Who might be in your microchurch, your community, your sphere of influence, who is just outside your evaluation of who is worth including, who is worth investing in, who has potential to lead? And might the Lord be inviting you and me to go exactly to the people that we least expect, just beyond our partiality? May we be people who pull the weeds. Aspire to be good soil, a good soil community planted with the seed of humility and mercy that overcomes judgment. Guided by the voice of Jesus and ready to say yes to any person he sends us to. As we come to the table this morning for communion, we remember together as a community that we are the chief of sinners. We are disqualified judges. And that left to our own devices, we would prioritize some over others, but as recipients of constant divine mercy, we distribute it freely. And this morning we rebuke the prayer of the Pharisee that judges those to his left and his right, and we embrace the prayer of the humble sinner that says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner.